Suicide amongst police officers remains one of the top killers and causes of death in the U.S. As a matter of fact, officers, that is police officers, first responders, are 54% more likely to commit suicide than any other civilian population. Today on The Silent Struggle, episode 26, we want to take a look at this tragic phenomenon and discuss, more specifically, suicide prevention with our guest. This is The Silent Struggle. I am Robert Asensio. And to my right, my partner is retired police chief and military historian David Magnuson. How are you? Doing good. This this is such an important episode. I mean, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what uh, Richard has to say. It's, Absolutely. Yeah. Huh. Absolutely. I mean, it keeps suicide continues to be at the top of um, the statistics again across the country. And, it, and it, it seems like it goes up every year a little bit more and more. And, and it touches the retired law yeah. enforcement as well. So it, it's quite an interesting paradigm, really. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm sure uh, Richard's going to shed a lot of light on that. OK, so right. To, let's go to that. Let's go to our guest, a retired police NYPD Lieutenant Richard Mack. How are you, sir? Hey, how you doing, guys? Good, good. And I failed to recognize the fact that you're now with the Wounded Blue. Um, That's correct. Working with them, your peer counselor, but you're also part of their leadership team that's helping reach officers across the country. But let's go into this suicide uh, tragedy here. Yeah, so um, a lot of people need to understand suicide uh, has been slowly rising amongst actually nationwide and particularly in the age of seniors. And in fact, the 75 to 84 year olds have seen the highest um, increase, uh, surprisingly. Um, and then the other uh, increase, not as much, but is the 25 to 30 year old bracket. Now I wanna start out by asking you a question, both of you a question. Do you believe that this anti-police sentiment that is growing and has existed in the country the last few years has contributed to an increase in officers committing, taking their lives. Uh, Chief, you want to go with that first? Uh, so I would think there is some, some sort of, of, of correlation behind it. I, I can't see how there wouldn't be. Yeah. What do you think, Richard? What do you yeah, think? Listen, <clears throat> Um, police are going through a lot of uh, high stress uh, in law enforcement nationally. Uh, it definitely has a national effect on the psyche. And of course, you combine uh, high rates of stress with high rates of post-traumatic stress with compounded stress and um, access to firearms. And then you start throwing in the barrage of anti-police sentiment that's been going on. I think it really started like the tide changing as far as attitudes from a media standpoint against the police, I think really began with Michael Brown in 2014. At least that was where I kind of feel it started to um, get a lot more national kind of anti-police sentiment, which is ironic because in that case, it was a hundred percent justified shooting by the police mm -hmm. officer. <clears throat> and um, it kind of escalated with uh, the riots in Baltimore and Freddie Gray, it was like 2017. And then, you know, it just, the anyone who's out there trying to do a good, a good thing with their life, serve the community, imagine, if you're constantly barraged with anti-police sentiment, how could it not affect you? It's at least in some way it could affect certain people more than others. And then it peaked in 2019 for whatever reason, we had a contagion of suicides on a national level. And especially here in New York, where we lost, I think 13 officers to suicide in one year. And it was tragic and, and devastating. And 
than that was before COVID hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is which was uh, more ironic that you know you had a rash of suicides before COVID even happened. Yeah, you know, Richard, we had you on the show before, and certainly <laughs> when we started the the podcast, right? First three episodes, I believe you were in the third one, and and you know you shared it with us your background how you're the victim you were forced to retire as a result of this anti-policing uh, you know combative subjects that that just caused you injury and forced you to retire and you went through some personal issues that's that correct. you described with that you described to us so you struggled. You struggled well, and you and you were able to overcome. And now you're out there helping others. But can you talk? Give the audience a perspective of that, 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 that helplessness and how you feel when you're out there trying to serve, and you're not only attacked but you're injured. You, you're causing <clears throat> your career. I was, uh, you know, attacked by a bunch of hardcore anti-police protesters who had weapons and uh, they had they were wearing armor. <laughs> You know, people who have weapons and armor aren't going to protest peacefully. And they were doing it to disrupt a police unity march that was run by pastors on the Brooklyn Bridge. So uh, these were not good people. And, you know, <clears throat> to say it didn't affect me, I would be lying. But um, having a good support system and people around you and therapists... Um, you know, it's good to, uh, it helps you maintain, uh, a healthy mental state, even when sometimes it can be a bit challenging. What are your, what are your thoughts about how we're seeing the increase of suicide? Because in 20, 2019 was, was the hype, but we also saw 2020, 2022, 21, 22 numbers still continue to go up. You know, in, in research I did, leading up to this to try to answer that question. I, I know I prefaced it earlier in saying that it's not really a medical opinion, but there was a psychological study, a psychologist study on mental health back in uh, 2012. And they referred to some earlier cases. And what they got to was the suicide rate was higher in smaller departments throughout the country than large ones. And they wanted to look into why that was. And, and it really was happening that way. I mean, we're putting NYPD aside for a second, obviously the largest department. Mm -hmm. But what they got to was, and here's the stress, <laughs> and I'll just read from it. Uh, the officers and families in small towns are under close scrutiny because the majority of citizens in their jurisdiction know them. In turns, officers have personal identification with persons involved in traumatic incidents or serious crimes that occur in their town, leading into an intensification of psychological after effects. Now, you have to think that would also transition to medium size and large size departments, too. But therein, you know, with that original question, do we think what's been going on with the anti-police, could that have some effect? Mm -hmm. I think most definitely it does. Uh, the constant barrage, the attack of that went on, um, you know, and what and what it led to and, and thus the climbing uh you know, it climbed peaked in 2019. Then in summer of 2020, you know, you had um, that that entire summer. It was one one thing after another. Mm -hmm. Even down here in, in Miami Dade County, referred to as the summer of love, right? Yeah, which was quite the opposite. Yeah, yeah. So there there have been studies out there. I mean, there it's 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 an interesting phenomenon why it's increasing, uh, but they're giving reasons as to why in the smaller departments, and it makes a great deal of sense once you read and go, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And then there, of course, with the backup, you know, backup sometimes is non-existent because you have to wait for another unit. Sometimes you're the only unit on shift at night. A lot of factors came into, into being, and that's what they attributed to the higher rate of suicide in the smaller departments than the larger ones. So there was something there that they that they could see clearly. This is before everything that went on from, from Brown forward to 2020, right? So what's being done on the suicide prevention and, and walk us through this, this turn this part of the conversation to a module, if you will, a suicide sure. prevention module for anybody that would watch it and be able to benefit because they're struggling. Absolutely. So the one thing I also agree with the chief on um, the bigger problem, especially with smaller departments and rural departments is isolation. 
And when you're out there, you're by yourself. Um, and with the isolation, you're also less calls. And that gives you a lot of time to think. And the problem with that is if you suffer from depression or even mild depression, and by the way, uh, there's something like 10% of the population will suffer a, a major uh, medical depressive disorder in their lifetime. Police are not uh, somehow exempt from that. And you combine that with access to a firearm and isolationism, which is one of the risk factors for people who may be suicidal, uh, hopelessness, uh, you know, and if they also suffer from things like ADHD or uh, alcoholism or um, major depressive disorder or post-traumatic stress, uh, these are all risk factors for suicide. And then, um, then the big one, which you combine all those or any of those risk factors together with the presence of a firearm, and that is... Uh, it's not about being anti-firearm. It's about understanding the risk factors for suicide and firearm uh, uh, presence of a firearm increases is a risk factor when it comes to someone who may be depressed or going through some type of mental health state. So the question becomes, what are the warning signs? So uh, people who are suicidal uh, will oftentimes give out hints. They will say things like, I want to die, or I wish I could go to sleep and not wake up. These are all kind of hints out there. And uh, people who are suicidal may do notes, financial arrangements. They're always talking about death, preoccupation, giving away um, their possessions. That's uh, a big one. And increased risk taking. Like I had a sergeant for many years, he was go out without a vest on. And uh, we didn't realize at the time that he may have had suicidal uh, tendencies. And heavy drug or alcohol use, which I know a lot of people who've exhibited those signs over the years at different times before I was uh, trained to see those signs. And um, unfortunately, uh, I've had several officers I've worked with who committed suicide. And the last one was Robert Echeverria. That was during the height of 2019. And I saw him that morning and he looked off. And I said to him, hey, you all right? And he said, yeah. And that was a midnight shift. And then he went home and he committed suicide that day. And I chalked it up to, oh, he's probably just tired. When obviously there was a lot more going on. So those are the warning signs. The question now becomes, what do you do when you get the warning signs? It's important to remain non-judgmental, stay calm, and ask the question. If someone's thinking of suicide, you asking the question will not make them do it faster or expedite the situation. There is a good odds that if someone is suicidal, most of the time they will be honest if they are. And I've asked that question many times and people who are suicidal, in my opinion, my experience is that they will tell you, say, Hey, are you thinking of killing yourself? Are you thinking of suicide? And in my experience, people who are at, a, at that stage where they need help and they want help will tell you, yes, I am. And that is the most important question to ask. And you have to reassure them that they can get help. And after you ask that question, if they say, yes, I'm thinking of killing myself, 
the next thing you need to ask is, well, how? And why to ask that question? So if someone's thinking of committing suicide and you ask how, and they say, well, I'm thinking of uh, going to work, my gun's at work, and I'm going to shoot myself. Why asking how is important because now you know you have a time constraint. You have a, a little bit more time to further try to inter intervene. If they say, yes, I'm going to kill myself with my gun and it's in my lap, then you know, uh, you understand the immediacy of trying to intervene. Or they could say, oh, I'm going to swallow a bunch of pills. Or I'm going to go, I've been really thinking about it. I'm going to the top of, of an office building where my friend works and I'm going to jump off. And these are all, that's always the important follow-up question. If they say they want to kill themselves. And then you need to do is slow things down. So that's the first two questions you have to ask. Are you thinking of killing yourself? And if they say yes, then you have to ask how, because that determines the level of immediacy in intervening. You mentioned something to me that 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 actually struck me, and and it and it and it rang through true based on my experience. You know, you mentioned about people who have jumped from from bridges and 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 that survived. In yes. what was it, Brooklyn? One of the bridges in New York. The, actually, no, it was actually Golden the, Gate. the Golden Gate Bridge yeah. in San Francisco. And every person that survived, when interviewed, all agreed and stated that the moment they left the bridge, they regretted their decision. Yeah. Wow. What's the same in you? You use it's a. Uh, Say it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And there, there's a lot of other things that need to be understood. Uh, I mean, it is uh, besides the eleventh leading cause of death. It's it's um, definitely misunderstood by the public, and definitely frowned upon. The thought of committing suicide. And the other thing to think of is 90% 90 of people who attempt suicide and live won't do it again. So what's the lesson there? The lesson there is intervene. And if you're not sure, ask the question. So true. So let's talk a little bit about the wounded blue. Uh, tell us a little sure. bit more. I know you introduced it previously, but tell us a little more about what you guys do and who you serve. Sure. So there are national peer groups. Uh, most peer groups are local. Um, and the Wounded Blue is a national peer support group. They will respond anywhere in the nation uh, to a major police incident where they're requesting uh, peer officers. We have a hotline. And the whole goal of Wounded Blue is to kind of fill in the gaps where uh, a lot of other departments might not be able to do so. For example, there was a uh, tragic uh, police, um, not police involved accident. It was a tragic incident where a couple of uh, children were uh, killed in a vehicle accident. And this was a small town that didn't have the resources for peer support and the wounded blue is able to fill in in situations like that and we also try to uh assist other officers who are injured in the line of duty they can call us and we have a website uh, they can ask us uh we, we try to get them resources where possible do you so have a number available kind of for them the yeah. the phone number uh it's uh eight four four TWB Hero. That's eight four four TWB Hero. And uh, that's number for the wounded blue. And the last thing I'd like to do is just encourage people, especially smaller departments, to get peer support uh for your officers. 
Uh, the fire departments, a lot of them have it. Some departments have um, regional teams uh, where they will have like the larger department, like a sheriff's department, will have a peer support team comprised of train of peer officers from the surrounding smaller departments. So this way they're able to kind of cover an entire area, not just from one department. Thank you. What are your thoughts? It's incredible information. Uh, I think the viewer got a, a good lesson on being able to aid, you know, something if, or see something and act upon it, do something, uh, asking the right questions. Um, there's a number now to call for the wounded blue. Uh, I mean, we got to make these numbers go down. Yeah. 11th, ele you, you did say 11th leading cause of death in this nation? Yes, that's correct. It's suicide. Think about that a minute. That's crazy, man. I mean, that, that's and, one life is too many, and yeah. and uh, yeah, and it's higher know, for, ironically, for white males and senior citizens of all people. And uh, you know, um, the last story I think I'll leave you with was uh, I was at a wedding. I was put at a cop table, a bunch of uh, police officers, active and retired, and a. Um, old Clint Eastwood looking type police officer sat right next to me and he doesn't, this is way before peer support existed is when he was on the police department and he was probably a Vietnam vet. And he asked if I was active at the time I was. And then the first thing he said to me, not knowing who, my background at all, he said, boy, I had a lot of friends that killed themselves over this job. And that right there is the reason why I do what I do. Because if I prevent one, it's absolutely worth it. Yeah. Thank you for that. And and retirees. Yes. I mean, we haven't even discussed much about retirees because I think, as you say, the senior, the statistics on the senior citizens who commit suicide across the country are. They're one of the largest. Law enforcement. That one of the highest risk factors, and they're the only group that really increased uh, during COVID as far as suicides, and that was the age group of seventy-five to eighty-four year olds. That's that isolation again. Yeah, but with the retirees for the law enforcement, it's also would would you agree a loss the loss of identity when they stepped away from the job? There's a number of hundred. Yes, a hundred percent. And the story I could quickly tell you was that of uh, Chief Silks from the NYPD. During 2019, Chief Silks was a real straight shooter. He loved the police department. And he was aging out, meaning uh, once you hit, uh, you can't be 63 and be a police officer in the NYPD. So you have to retire. And his like last day when he was supposed to go down to retire. He hadn't told anybody. He took his department car and he drove down an isolated street and he committed suicide because he didn't, he couldn't leave that, that identity behind. So that's a whole nother uh, section <laughs> that needs to be covered and that really doesn't get the attention it deserves. Well, maybe we could do that in a future episode. But I wanted to go back to something real quick and and um, the anti the effects, if you will, of the anti policing mentality um, movement, if you will. And I know we in South Florida are somewhat immune from it because we, as a large as a whole. The community is very supportive of law enforcement, but I know other parts of the country, it, it's not the same. But what the effects are, you're having a harder time recruiting and retaining police officers. And we talked about that before. And there's police shortage on the road. Officers, according to policeone.com, officers were recently surveyed and they were asked, what are the largest, what are the biggest obstacles you find in law enforcement. And this is what they 
a couple of bullet points of what they said. Recruitment and retention, 52%. Uh, risk of prosecution for doing their work on duty, whether justified or not, they feel that they can be prosecuted. That's about 17% of the those surveyed felt that way. Media, negative <coughs> coverage of the media of police action. Mm -hmm. About 15% of those interviewed said that they feel that way. And then ambush. And the irony is that the ambusher being killed in the line of duty was the lowest of their, the least of their obstacles that they saw that they were going to encounter <laughs> coming here. Isn't that something? That was 9%. When we know that you had, it has to be on the swivel when you're out there on the streets, certainly in crime riddled neighborhoods where you're going after subjects or trying to stop people from committing crimes. Let's face it. Some people will not think twice about hurting a police officer or killing you. Ambushes some went up. People, what was that? Ambushes went up yeah. over the over police involved uh, deaths. They went up. But yet the police officer Their perception of it, right. did not see that as a major right. obstacle to them. What they saw was, you know, the effect of the anti police sentiment, which is recruitment and selection and retention, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's terrible because uh listen. Policing is a highly stressful job, and in certain areas, it's more stressful than others. At certain times of year, each have their own difficulties, and uh, the leadership void that is going on nationwide is dramatically affecting the police mentality. And you know, uh, officers should when they're doing their jobs should not be in fear of being prosecuted for doing their jobs, which is why we really need to uh, take care of our officers and show them that we care about them and that we want them to be healthy because a healthy, mentally healthy officer will also be in a better position to make proper decisions out in the field. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, any closing thoughts? No, I think he, he, you know, the leadership part is extremely big. I think that gets lost in the woodwork a lot. You know, there, there are still too many that, that profess ch Chateau leadership. They're sipping their Bordeaux up in the Chateau while they're sending their troops down to battle, uh, you know, metaphorically mm -hmm, speaking, mm -hmm. and they're nowhere to be found when, when the troops need them. So the leadership is a very important component. I, I add that to the difficulty of retaining people, good, a lot of good people leaving, be careful who starts moving up the ranks. Yeah. And for you that's watching, if you want a thought, think about this. Without police officers, who's going to come to your aid when there's an emergency? Who's going to police the streets? Who's going to prevent the criminals from doing their criminality in the community? I say we're all um, stakeholders and it's incumbent upon all of us to support our law enforcement who is doing the right work, who is honorably serving. On that note, um, this has been another episode of The Silent Struggle. You can find us on YouTube and all most major podcasts under Silent Struggle, hosted by military and police veterans. Myself, Robert Asensio, Dave Magson. We thank our producer behind the scenes, Rachel Brummage. The Miami's Community News team, Michael Miller, Grant Miller, thank you. Audience, Richard, thank you. We'll see you in the next time. Keep up the good fight.